I think we can take off the take off take off the masks. Peter, take off the mask. But it's good for the photos. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, this is uh, a side event at the UNFCC SB56. And a warm welcome and good morning to everybody. My name is Judith Soleski from Inforce Network, International Network for Sustainable Energy, and I will be the moderator of this session. First of all, I would like to, uh, we would like to introduce the uh, organizers. Yeah, well, maybe I, I should start with that, that uh, introduce to the program. We will uh, have uh, local solutions in East Africa. We have 100% renewable scenarios from Kenya. We have local solutions in South Asia, India. Um, and we have sufficiently overlooked climate actions in Global North. In afterwards, there will be uh, uh, proposals or proposals from Infos East Africa for getting local solutions in GSD. And we have comments from Stefan Nizigoka <laughs> from Ministry of Energy Kenya. And last but not least, we have dialogue how to integrate local solutions in GSD to strengthen some climate action questions and answers. So, um, now I would like uh, the welcoming from the organizers, and I would like to give the word to Gona Boya Olesen from Enforce Network. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm uh, actually here representing uh, uh, the. We have four organizations who are co-organizing this, and uh, I'm also working with Sustainable Energy in Denmark, which is also working with some of these lifestyle issues. I will. I'll speak on in my presentation. Yeah, and then I would like to uh, introduce Nordic Focus Center for Renewable Energy from Denmark, which is also co-organizer. And uh, welcome all of you in their name. And uh, maybe Miri, you could say a word for me for uh, East Africa. Thank you, Judith. My name is Mary Swai. I work for Tanzania Traditional Energy Development Organization. We are the regional coordinators of Winforce East Africa. Uh, we are very happy to be here today and participate in discussion regarding the local climate solution and sustainable energy in relation to global stock take. Uh, we are really happy that uh, the discussions are going on and we are part of it. And as we, are, we've, we, we have already known from the IPCC report, which has confirmed that climate change is really happening. And uh, <clears throat> different countries, including East Africa, have been affected by the impacts of climate change. We have uh, been experiencing uh, uh, negative impacts, which has been affecting uh, our local community and even the production system in our country and the economy as a whole. So to me, I'm really happy to be part of this discussion of today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Norbert Miandia from Suswatch, Kenya. Good morning, good evening. My name is uh, Norbert Nyandere uh, from Sustainable Environmental Development Watch, a national organization that uh, works on uh, different uh, issues of uh, climate change, uh, energy uh, in Kenya and also in East Africa. So welcome and uh, thank you for uh, coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I uh, would like to this, this was, I'm sorry, this was the slide for the organizations. I didn't follow up. So it was International Network for Sustainable Energy, Sustainable Energy Denmark, Nordic Focus Center for Renewable Energy, and Suswatch Kenya. And now comes uh, 
the local solutions in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And uh, Mary Svai will present it from Tatero and Infos East Africa. She will uh, highlight the climate solutions, uh, climate and energy, sustainable energy solutions in East Africa, and it is their contribution to climate change. Focus will be on energy for cooking and other needs, and how to overuse, how the overuse of wood and other biomass contribute to climate change as the main driver for climate change in many countries, including East African countries. The presentation will also include examples of missing local solutions in NDCs and other inputs to global stock take. She will also raise attention on, the, on an online catalog of 65 uh, solutions, which is amazing, and uh, which you can also watch online later on. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll just uh, take you through uh, East Africa Local Climate and Sustainable Energy Solution Catalog, which is an outcome of the uh, project which is implemented by the partners of the Infose East Africa. And as I said, I work for Tanzania Traditional Energy Development Organization is an organization in Tanzania, non-government organization. I'm the manager responsible for bioenergy and climate change. Uh, just a bit about TATEDO. TATEDO uh, is committed to facilitate access to sustainable energy services in Tanzania. We, our overall objective is to improve people's livelihood by increasing their access to sustainable energy and technologies. We do promote a number of technologies. This include uh, sustainable energy mini grids. We also promote uh, improved cook stoves. Uh, we also focus on solar PV system, solar drying technology, sustainable charcoal value chain, briquette, from carbonized biowast, efficient electric cooking appliances, but also the electric mobility. Some of the, our activities, we do, we do have a project on the grounds, and we do also disseminate uh, energy information, and we do also behavioral change campaign. We do lobby and advocacy to support energy, energy and climate change policies, we support development of sustainable energy enterprises. Also, we do some related consultant services and we develop network and partnership. Yeah, as Judith said, that uh, I will build my case focusing on the biomass energy production and use in Sub-Saharan and in particular uh, East Africa. Uh, as has been uh, indicated by Sustainable Energy for All uh, track, progress track report of 2021, more people who have less access to clean cooking solution are found in Sub-Saharan Africa. And apart from that, uh, biomass energy contribute to 90% of the total energy consumed in most of the East African countries. Not only that, unfortunately, what is uh, a challenge is that most of the biomass which is used in this country, they, it is produced and used in an unsustainable way. And most of it is used in household and the commercial entities like uh, restaurants and also the institution. So if you want to intervene, uh, you need to maybe to focus on those areas where uh, most of the energy, the biomass energy is utilized. Uh, 
due to this unsustainable uh, utilization of biomass and production of biomass, it is really contributing to forest and land degradation. Not only that, but also greenhouse gas emission and negative human health effects. For instance, in Tanzania, it is estimated that about 30% of the deforestation which is happening is attributed by charcoal making. And not only that, also biomass production and use is estimated to contribute between 2 to 7% of the global greenhouse gas emission. So in sub-Saharan Africa, it is estimated to account about a third of this emission. Therefore, you see how, how big is the challenge with the biomass in relation to contribution to uh, deforestation, but also greenhouse gas emission. Uh, if, we, if we consider that the use of production and use of biomass will be increasing. For instance, in Tanzania, where it is estimated that by 2012, it was the use, the demand was about 2.3 million tons. But then it is projected to increase to up to four, to double up to 4.6 by 2030, if no intervention will be undertaken. That you can see how much the effect could be. And <clears throat> apart from that, even if we are doing a number of intervention, but fuel stacking is some, something which has been found common practice in East Africa, where uh, even if people are transitioning to alternative fuel, but still charcoal remain uh, to be a part of the energy mix. Then if we could then see how, what, what really is the challenge here, is the way we produce and the way we use. For instance, the production of charcoal uh, is, is very inefficient way where the kiln which is used, uh, it has the efficiency ranging from 80 to 15 percent. It means 85 percent of the wood which is used to produce charcoal is the wastage and then it has been estimated like if you want to produce one kg of charcoal, you need to use like seven kg of wood to get one, uh, one kg of charcoal using those traditional kind of kilns. Not only that, but also another wastage happen when it comes to the use, where the type of stoves is, which is being in use, it has an efficiency of about 10 to 15. Again, the charcoal which has been produced in a very inefficient way, it is then used in a very inefficient way that only 10 to 15 percent of the energy is used to cook, and then the 85 percent is wastage again. So intervention to address challenges in this sector is key, and is, uh, as it also provides opportunity to enhance climate actions. Here you see the pictures. It just try to show you the charcoal production and charcoal in the market, but also type of the stoves which have been in use, those traditional ones. Therefore, here we are proposing that if we real uh, we, we think this is a critical, uh, critical sector which you need to be intervened. Although we are also promoting transition, but yet we have seen people, they don't trans transition completely. They still, uh, they still practice fuel stacking. So it is better that we also focus on improving the kind of stoves they are used, but also the kiln. Like here, there are some of the stoves which is using biomass, has the efficiency of about 54.8. We can see the efficiency have been really improved, nearly approaching the efficiency of LPG stoves. 54.8 is high efficient. It has the ability to reduce fuel consumption by 75%. Again, uh, we are also proposing to use improved charcoal production kilns and 
This one, just slight improvement, it has raised the efficiency to at least double uh, from the traditional work. Where here you, you need like 4.5 kg of wood to produce one kg of charcoal. It is an improvement, but there's a room to improve more. Apart from that, we also uh, recommend to use the alternative energy, like efficient electric pressure cooker, which has the efficiency of about 50 to, 20 to 75%, and it can cook faster compared to the other one, but also I could also cite an, uh, an experiment which we did in Tanzania, where we tried to see, uh, we tried to, 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 to use different appliances, like there was kerosene, uh, kerosene stove, also charcoal stove and LPG, and then we took the same amount of, uh, of food to cook in, in those appliances. For instance, beans, where it used like using, cooking using kerosene, we used, uh, it, it required, the cost incurred was seven times compared to use of electric pressure cooker. And then when we are using the LPG, it came like 10 times. Somebody using LPG were supposed to pay 10 times compared to electric pressure cooker, and then 13 times using charcoal. So charcoal is more inefficient, but also is cost, costly compared to other fuels. After observing all that, we, have, we then came up with a catalog for local solution, and here we have docu documented 60 uh, practical climate local solutions that save energy, water, food insecurity challenges, which are facing local communities. This catalog is available online, but also offline and in print, like the one we see here. This is the imprint copy. And here, if you go online, this is the, the front page, what you will see, but also you can see different uh, local solutions. Among them, I've been also talking about them. And here, this is the way our catalog is organized. It is organized in the, it categorized into a solution which are required for cooking, cooking fuel, light, water, and then if you go down, you see the subcategory where you see, again, more different categories of those local solutions. And the catalog also offer an, a number of information, including how does the solution contribute to, to climate effect, but also there are short film or clips which shows how to use it, but also how to repair in case of damage. To conclude, local solution has potential to contribute to reduce greenhouse gas emission and therefore offer opportunity to strengthen climate action if included in the NDC, but then implemented and then its progress monitored. We propose that in the global stock take, it is reported to which extent these local solutions are used in the country, focusing on its relevance, how they are included in climate plan and NDC, and which potential they have for further reduction of emission in particular countries. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, I really encourage everybody to go into this uh, website and then looking for these uh, um, solutions. And also, we are well, we also very happy if anybody else would find solutions which are missing. So please look at it. And if you find some solutions which you know of, then uh, please let us know and we will include it. We are currently updating it. And now I would like to introduce uh, Norbert Niandira from Suswatch, Kenya. And he will speak about 100% renewable scenarios for Kenya. Focus can be on how to expand from NDC to a longer term strategy and both reduce climate impact and support development. Uh, 
No, but the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, as has been mentioned, I'm from Kenya. And uh, in Kenya, then uh, the organization, as I mentioned earlier, we actually engage in uh, uh, different uh, projects which are doing, uh, touching on climate change and also uh, energy is one of them. So to this end, then I'm going to give uh, a presentation on 100% renewable energy for Kenya. This is a document that, uh, that the team uh, has been working on and uh, we developed this because we are focusing uh, perhaps by 2050, then uh, uh, we can transition as a nation to 100% renewable energy. But before I begin my presentation, I'd also like to mention that uh, Kenya as a nation has been recognized uh, worldwide by uh, the Bloomberg Index report that actually categorized uh, and ranked Kenya as uh, uh, in the top five worldwide in terms of investment they're doing on uh, uh, hydropower, uh, the wind, and also geothermal. So the kind of investments uh, the nation is actually putting on this is uh, uh, encouraging. So to this end, then someone might ask, what are these renewable energy? Uh, in most cases, as we all are aware, these are energies that encompasses all renewable sources including bioenergy, geothermal, hydropower, ocean, solar, and wind energy. So 100% uh, energy means that all the sources of energy uh, meet all the end users' needs in certain locations. And uh, this could be actually uh, maybe derived from 100, um, renewable energy sources 24 hours per day. And uh, any storage facility to help balance the energy supply must also use energy derived only uh, from renewable uh, resources. So if you look at the ARENA report that was done in 2020, it uh, gives a lot of elaboration on how actually this is done. So um, throughout the entire modern age, uh, mankind has used fossil fuels to meet its energy requirements, as all we are aware about that. But uh, as human development is escalated, the uncertainty of such energy actually is becoming apparent. So global fuel supplies have deteriorated over time, and the atmosphere has become uh, so much polluted so the search for renewable sources of energy has begun, and uh, uh, this is just an aspiration for ensuring a sustainable future. So why this uh, in Kenya? Uh, one, we looked at uh, the different potential that uh, this renewable energy, 100% renewable energy, has. And uh, from this, that's just to align, uh, maybe economically, it, it will, of course, create new jobs, uh, boost economic growth, uh, harvest social and uh, health benefits, uh, mitigate impacts of climate change, and last but not least, uh, decrease energy costs. So what are these potential uh, for renewable energy uh, uh, in Kenya? One, uh, from the study that has been done uh, nationally, renewables provided 92.3% of Kenya's electricity generation in 2020, which is commendable. And to this end, then uh, you can see that graph, um, that, uh, that pie chart, actually, which is... Um, uh, elaborating on the share of electricity generation in Kenya in 2020. You can see from there that uh, geothermal led the way at 44%, followed by hydro at 36%. Wind was at least uh, 11%, then uh, thermal oil at 7%, uh, followed by some utility scale uh, solar and uh, sources, which actually each uh, had 1%. So Kenya's great uh, Rift Valley has an estimated geothermal potential of 10,000 uh, megawatts. And uh, this uh, dependable uh, on clean energy potential puts uh, uh, the, 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 the nation in a great position to get to 100% renewable very quickly. So you can look at those different sources and uh, what actually uh, the Kenya uh, population has actually, because we have that demand and we are not utilizing this to full potential. So you can imagine if uh, these uh, three or so major um, in, uh, power sources, then uh, uh, actually we maybe uh, uh, maybe harvest more from that, then you can imagine the kind of uh, 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 energy that we can actually generate as a country. So um, the energy demand for energy, the population is growing, of course, and uh, currently we stand at uh, 48 million uh, people. That was in the last census that was carried out in 2019. And uh, perhaps in 2050, because uh, when uh, you look at the graphs, actually there, we, uh, we have uh, 
a growth rate, which actually comes to if uh, look if maybe uh, looked at uh, by 2050, then uh, we could even be more than that uh, number. Maybe we could be double that number. So the GDP continues to grow at five uh, percent uh, annually, and this uh, GDP is five times bigger. Could be five times bigger in 2050. So the demand for energy services, of course, will be higher with the growth of um, this population, and this will increase energy. Um, uh, maybe increasing energy efficiency will limit growth in energy demand for cooking, transport, light industry, but also without new actions, uh, then uh, energy demand uh, will still grow anyway. So uh, we did this when looking at these different potentials, then uh, we came up with this 100% uh, new energy uh, development uh, for Kenya, where we've uh, actually proposed a different uh, uh, ways of this, how this can be done. So when this is done, then we're going to have efficient uh, cooking, change uh, transport gradually to electricity, hydrogen and renewable fuels, uh, make charcoal production uh, much more efficient, maybe from 15% uh, today to uh, maybe 33%. Uh, and then expand wind power to 9,000 megawatts. You've seen that we have that, that potential because unlike other countries, at least we are positioned well and we receive all this wind which come, uh, uh, maybe there are some strategic points in Kenya that uh, we can harvest wind. The solar uh, power, we have solar all year. So in most cases, then uh, it's also a very good potential. We can actually power uh, most of our energy from also solar. And then the geothermal power also has a potential of five, uh, generating this 5,600 megawatts. And then uh, expand electric interconnectors to 3,000 megawatts uh, capacity. And then uh, build uh, uh, biomass power plants to balance uh, demand and energy. So thank you so much. And that is what uh, uh, we have uh, for this. Uh, uh, documents we've uh, actually put it online you can go to our website as well and you'll get a very good elaboration of this 100 percent renewable energy thank you so much yeah thank you very much uh, norbert um, for this very exciting uh, presentation about 100 percent renewables in kenya which is uh, looks like really possible. There is resources, there is sun, there is wind. So we are looking forward to uh, the comments uh, later on from the, from the government of Kenya. And now, now I would like to introduce Sanjeev Nathan from uh, Inforce South Asia in Seda, India, and he will be virtual, so I hope it will work. And for those who are <coughs> uh, just came or streamed, uh, so we are at the uh, UNFCC SB56 uh, side event, and the title is Local Climate Sustainable Energy Solutions in Global Stock Take, 100% Renewables, Sufficiency in East Africa, India, and Europe. And now I would like to welcome Sanjeev from Inseda, India. Hello. Uh, Welcome, you can, we can hear you. Oh, great, great. Good morning, good afternoon. Yeah, how to switch up? Judith, will, will you be able to put my slide, or shall I share it from my? Oh yeah, we will share the. We would like to share the presentation. You have to switch it. Okay. How to how to switch? It is possible. Uh, yeah. Are you able to see it now, my slide? No, no, no. It is sitting here. Okay, I think I'm sharing it. Now. Is okay. It, uh, yeah, it is showing okay. now, and then I think you can you can manage yourself <laughs> as far as I understand. Yes, yes, great, great. So, thank you very much, Judith, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from various parts of the world. I'm Sanjeev Nathan. I'm talking about the local climate solutions in global stock trade and eco development in South Asia, so India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. 
and from INSEDA, which is Integrated Sustainable Energy and Ecological Development Association. A little bit of, uh, about INSEDA. As an NGO registered in 1995, we're working in India and South Asia. And we have observer status at uh, UNFCCC since 2015. Dr. Raymond Weiss, President, Come Chief Executive in SEDA, is the founder member of Enforce. And we are holding Digital Secretariat of Enforce South Asia since 1995. We're innovator of low carbon, bamboo based uh, affordable green technologies developed by SEDA. And designed three kinds of biogas plants and innovated. Uh, Eco village development model as an effective mitigation adaptation solution. We transfer these technologies to various countries, and we are also working on a carbon credit project under gold standard. The low carbon climate resilient eco village development uh, project we are working in South Asia since 2015, and uh, in 2020 July we have rolled out uh, next gen EVD project where partners are in SEDA, India, CRT, Nepal, Gramish Shakti, Bangladesh, IDEA, Sri Lanka, Enforce, South Asia Regional, and Kansa Regional. This is the program supported, management support is by DIB Denmark and technical support by Enforce, and is financially supported by CSU Denmark. Uh, these uh, EVD solutions, we have <coughs> done feasibility st studies and uh, creating model villages and we are installing these solutions uh, with Inseda, installing, uh, promoting the solutions like uh, bamboo reinforced biogas plants, bamboo reinforced rainwater harvesting, solar poly greenhouse, on a bamboo frame, solar tunnel dryer, and bamboo frame, bamboo house, and bamboo compost baskets, vermi composting, kitchen garden, solar street lights and lanterns, and day night solar cooper with battery, and the Hira and Jwala into poke stove and energy plantation, uh, particularly this uh, Hira cook stove uh, that removes not only indoor pollution, but outdoor pollution as well. Then in Nepal, we have hydraulic ram pump, improved water mill, uh, solar water pumps, and Matra Bhumi improved cook stove, improved uh, institutional cook stoves, uh, cabinet solar dryer, uh, rooftop rainwater harvesting, vermicomposting, biogas, uh, greenhouse tunnel and with drip irrigation, high value tree plantation, induction cooker, and renewable water, uh, renewable water lifting systems. And then in Bangladesh, we have household by the plant solar home systems, uh, bamboo reinforced slurry pits, solar street light, rain, uh, retained heat uh, cookers, improved cook stoves, and sort of solar water pumps, rainwater having system, kitchen garden, and solar system for village shops. Likewise, in Sri Lanka, we have Anagi improved cook stove, uh, movable and sunken type institutional stoves, uh, roof for the harvesting, and non portable biomass dryer. We have mushroom cultivation and movable institutional biomass stove chimney. Uh, these all technology, along with it, there is self help group, income generation programs with self help group also. So, these, uh, this EVD model is an integrated development approach to help reducing emissions and to provide so, uh, social benefits. Just India. In India, 70% of 1.4 billion population lives in rural areas. And uh, there's a potential to save 3 million tons of firewood by improved cook stove alone, and 340 million tons of carbon uh, CO2 uh, per year. And with biogas, there's a potential of 70 million, billion, 75 million biogas plants, and we can have saving of 200 million tons of wood, and 3 million tons of uh, CO2 per year. There are actual benefits Clean kitchen, improve health, and uh, for women and children, reduction in drudgery, reduction in movement in forest, and with the roof water harvesting system, 150 uh, family, immigrant families can save 1.5 billion cubic meter of water, and thus uh, save in emission in pumping. Water. Apart from that, reduction in emission as uh, less chemical and fertilizer will be used because of ten garden composting and. Uh, uh, social forestry, forestry, environment and health, soil health, soil water conservation, quality of vegetable and fruits is available, available to firewood near homes, increased income and uh, increased nutrition input for women and children. And with, we have we got here things several technologies which use bamboo. Uh, bamboo has several advantages like uh, broad CO2 environmental distortion. Uh, 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 Risk pressure and engine control. 
uh, moisture consumption and adding of income for farmers and women. And then uh, there are impact on GHG emissions and reduced indoor and outdoor pollution, conservation of water, improved soil health, and several others. Now, all these, uh, this EVD concept has contributed to 14 SDGs out of 17, uh, uh, focus on clean energy and climate action. Uh, that was the focus of our program, but it touches all the SDG solar, uh, social goals of it. Now, uh, we also uh, have an online catalog of local solutions from South Asia. Uh, this uh, solutions we developed by four partners. We have uh, this is available at info.org/ev, and uh, this description of solution organized uh, category wise and country wise and uh, of course and go through it and we look forward for your inputs and comments that you did mention uh, you can send your details to these email ids that are given here and we will surely be incorporating them in our blog now we have a policy brief uh, enhancing climate emission and global stock uh, with local for the south asia uh, this paper showcases local energy solutions that are important for climate action. The examples from South Asia it proposes that in the global stock take is reported to which extent uh, these local solutions are used in each country, how they are included in the climate plans and indices, and the potential they have for further reduction of emissions in each country. It proposes to include local solutions in the climate plans as they contribute to local uh, climate action as well as poverty reduction and giving them equal access to funding. The plans should uh, tailor national climate programs uh, with the uh, state microfinance and involving a civil society. And then the paper shares some of the success of solutions and uh, you can see the website where you can download it. Uh, there are several other publications uh, for partner for partnership project, and you can go through uh, those publications which are available on the websites. The websites are given here. Uh, catalog and proceedings will also be available on the website. The window. And for any other uh, information, you can always contact us at the email addresses given there. Uh, this, uh, thank you, and thank you everyone for uh, patient listening. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy that the technology also worked. <laughs> and uh, how how do I now switch further uh, to the? I would like to show the the presentation again. Thank you very much. Oh. And uh, here I would like to mention that uh, you can pick up a copy of this uh, policy brief here. And it is, a, it is a policy brief which was made in cooperation with the Enforce uh, South Asia and Climate Action Network South Asia. Gamin Shakti in uh, Bangladesh, CRT in, in Nepal, and IDEA in Sri Lanka and in Zeta. And now, now I would like to introduce Gunnar Boya Olesen from Inforce Europa in Denmark. And uh, he will speak about that integrating energy sufficiency is an overlooked uh, climate action in the global north. And this will also focus on how many northern people can reduce consumption without reducing, without reducing their quality of life. And uh, welcome. This is, I'm looking forward to this presentation. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And if you could take the next uh, slide. Uh, yeah, as I said uh, before, 
I'm works working with sustainable energy, but also with the National Network for Sustainable Energy, and we have been working on 100% renewable energy for, for many years. You heard about Kenya, but we have mostly worked in, in Europe. And uh, while you previous heard about how the different local solutions, most of the developing countries can come together to feed into uh, renewable energy scenarios, but also to more local eco-village development projects. I'll now speak about some other things, how we actually handling and some of the issues we are focusing on, which we really want to have a fast transition to renewable energy in the north, where we obviously have had the most emissions in the past and therefore have a, both a moral and also a, other obligations to move faster. Um, I'll first speak a little bit about our European part of the Enforce Network, where we are engaged in EU energy and climate policies, which obviously is driving a lot of the European politics since this 27 of the uh, biggest countries uh, in the Western countries. Uh, we are also supporting policies for local energy communities and uh, Enforce as a network is in itself member of the Alliance for Energy Communities. We are supporting energy efficiency with uh, something called EU eco-design rules, which are setting requirements for all kinds of things we buy, from lamps to fridges to um, many other things, and the pumps, for instance. And uh, we have set some strict requirements, and it actually turned out that it's quite efficient because companies are able to fulfill these requirements if they are set in a dialogue with them, but without just letting them keep on producing the the old inefficient stuff. Um, we also worked, as I said, with this 100% renewable energy, and lately we started to work on uh, energy sufficiency, which I'll come back to. I mean, we can't just keep on consuming, even though we do it more efficient. So we need also do with sufficient. Uh, then we're organizing webinars, seminars, and we actually also made a new catalog of uh, local simple solutions, but not on obviously another kind of solutions, how you can actually save energy in a hurry if you are living in, in a European country. Next slide, please. And uh, that was the link for the uh, for that, the Selni uh, catalog for our, for these local solutions. Next, next one. And uh, then we are uh, working on energy sufficiency as a way of, uh, or changing lifestyles. In uh, Europe, I mean, as you know, we have quite a high consumption of, well, fossil fuels, many other things. And uh, what happened to it is that uh, we are actually able to uh, live with less in many ways uh, and actually live in some often better with less. And uh, that's not something which has been captured by all the climate plans. They're all working on energy, renewable energy, many of them, with the good ones at least. And they're working on energy efficiency, how we can get the, everything be more efficient. But we also have to think about how much we consume. And uh, uh, there are some examples here. We have seen that many people stay in big houses after, they, for instance, their children went away or if they got divorced, somehow the, the family got smaller. If we could just, and many just have barriers to move, and if you can remove those barriers, help people basically to move, we can actually reduce the heated area so we don't need so much heated area. Um, many Europeans have high temperatures, more than 21 degree in, in the winter, and, if, and we have been some Surveys have shown that they actually have enough to live not in very cold temperatures, but just one degree lower if they, for those. And if that will be each time uh, heating reduced with 5%, at least in middle Europe, you reduce uh, consumption for the heating with 5%. And heating is one of the biggest consumer of energy in, in Europe. Um, but also, and, um, electricity is used for so many things, I'll not go into the details, but we assume by looking at all the different uses of electricity in the homes, we could reduce that by 20% by turning off things when they're not in use, by uh, using, say, less televisions and other things. And for transport in Europe, in many part, European countries, personal transport is one of the biggest consumer of uh, fossil fuels. It's mainly driven by oil. And if you, and we've uh, we have been introducing or proposing a 
package of a number of measures that together could resume, uh, could reduce uh, transport consumption by as much as 43%, or at least car use, uh, with combination of uh, sustainable mobility measures. Next slide, please. And uh, here are some of the main proposed uh, measures. Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's all about uh, improved railways. It's about uh, uh, development of better opportunities for having urban planning, where it's more attractive to use soft transport, like uh, bicycling mainly, but also uh, walking. Uh, it's about having uh, urban planning uh, also where you have principle where it's more favorable to get around by bicycle and uh, and not having cars as a priority everywhere and the problem with cars is basically that uh, they are t they're consuming a lot of energy compared to what they move they are also filling up a lot of space also give a lot of uh, traffic jam uh, but uh, so I mean we have bicycles as one of the good solutions together with public transport the same as another thing is reduction of road speed, particular motorway speeds reduces uh, a lot if you are stop which you can reduce that. And of course, you can also have more car sharing and uh, yeah, reduce subsidies for, for car use. I think next slide. And if you take all these things together, you can see uh, how it's possible, how it would be possible to reduce uh, energy consumption, and here is the final energy consumption, which is the things that are actually going in, I mean, which are actually directly consumed. And uh, you can see that uh, going from today uh, or from the uh, yeah, 2019 was the latest one. 2020 is a little different because of COVID. And then uh, we had uh, an energy efficient and uh, renewable energy plan called EDA, Climate Smart from 2030, but if we add to that the sufficiency that I just described, then we can go lower. And next slide. And uh, here's the same thing uh, where we just show, well, here we show together with the energy agency, Danish energy agency, DS, uh, baseline, and then this uh, Climate Smart and then uh, two versions of uh, including sufficiency and one with also a little more electric cars. And you can see that it's actually possible to get further down. Next slide. Uh, on this slide, uh, you basically see the emissions because what we have is that we already reduced a lot of emissions in Denmark from uh, 1990 in electricity and uh, also in heating, but uh, still transport is one of the big things we can still reduce a lot. So here's a reduction from 1990, how much we went down in 2019, and these different uh, scenarios here with the EDA Klima Smart, and if you go, well, longer down. Sorry, that was just a quick jump, but I think that's okay, because that's just, it just around. This is just for the, uh, 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 for how to do it, uh, what's the effect on the CO2 emissions for doing all this. Next slide. Or next, and this is how much reductions that we get, but it's just in the energy sector. So while energy sector is still the easier one to reduce than, for instance, uh, transport. Uh, no, transport is harder. We try to reduce it here, but there's also agriculture, which is harder to reduce. So, all in all, as conclusion, we would uh, say that all countries can reduce more, and in developed countries and uh, particular in, for instance, in Europe, uh, energy sufficiency is one of the forgotten issues that we all think can be reduced, included in, uh, in the global stock take. And first of all, it should have been included in disease, which is not properly done. And now it's time for the global stock take to take in new solutions also. And uh, that's why we propose that this is taken up here. It was already recognized in the IPCC that are speaking about that we go, had to go to more uh, sustainable lifestyles, but it need to go from the research and our uh, promotion here into the actual policies on the national level, but also here in, in the guiding, guidelines for the GST. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for Gunnar about this. I think we all have to think a little bit about this lifestyle, also especially in the north, but uh, in or we have to examine ourselves that actually that uh, we can do so much as we are so many people. So if we all change our lifestyles, then it is also me means a lot. And I hope that uh, Global Stock Tech will take this on. And now I would like to um, introduce Richard Kimbova from the Uganda Coalition for Sustainable Development. And uh, he will present our proposals, how to uh, getting the local solutions into the Global Stock Tech in, uh, from East Africa. And we will also, and maybe, uh, and also South Asia. And we will focus on our proposals for what we propose for the Global Stock Tech. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Judith, uh, and everyone who is in this room. I think you have to have the microphone on. Much, on. much. It is here. on. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you very much uh, once again. So this just proposals of getting the, what we have had already from Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Denmark, South Asia into the the global stock tech. So already we have seen the the, the solutions. These are just examples, just to recap. Uh, of household, but also commercial, but also those that are uh, in, in institutions that, that are possible. Uh, we, we have also seen the local climate and energy solutions um, in Kenya that, is, that's, that has, uh, has already been done. Now, uh, we are aware that the global stock take will be conducted over three years um, as, as, uh, in terms of collection and then we have a technical assessment that goes into well into mid-2023, but also consideration of the outputs uh, by 20, COP28 that should inform the 2025 20, NDCs. So this is a process, and we have a chance to, to, to influence and have the local solutions included. So, but the current NDCs fall short of meeting the Paris Agreement goals, uh, principally the 1.5 degree centigrade, as you can see through the, the scientific reports as well as the financial goal, of course. So what is important is that the global stock tech is used as a vehicle to identify additional actions that can increase the ambition and close the glaring gaps that are mentioned above. But how can we do this? Um, we have uh, a framework in our, our analysis, as we see it, that it's very important you know, we have this gear. A gear makes things you know, work faster rather than, uh, you know, simple, uh, rather than using your own, uh, uh, those who are mechanical or science, do, you can know that when you have a gear, it helps you to move things faster. So this is the, the sort of thing we'll bring in here, that if we have NDCs that are ambitious, uh, be them conditional or unconditional, and they take up these local solutions, and then you have the climate finance that can be scaled up again to, for, to adaptation, to, to, to meet adaptation needs for, uh, local, for based on local solutions and nature-based solutions, and then you have the, uh, the the realization that we have to listen and continuously learn from these interests that is that we see around the young people. It is heightened. The innovations is there. The civil society are very you know anxious to do things. Then the gears move, and we are likely to see an, improve, a, 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 an increase in ambition and an uptake of, uh, of climate actions that can help us meet the Paris Agreement. So in terms of uh, the local solutions, we are seeing uh, that, that there's, there's, a there's a challenge of uh, of biomass, overuse of biomass, first of all, in our regions, but also emissions, uh, is the, the emissions uh, is still high from fossil fuels. We know the important drivers to reduce, that the important drivers to reduce emissions uh, is very important that, that large-scale solutions are not the only ones that can, can overset this. Because uh, we see that uh, the local solutions are also equally important. Uh, in addition to contributing to development and poverty reduction at that level. Therefore, what do we propose? We say that within the GST, it's very important that uh, local solutions uh, th that are used in each country 
are included in the climate plans, be them national adaptation plans, be them strategies, as well as the NDCs. Because the potential they have is huge, not only for reducing emissions, but also to build resilience and adaptation in each of the countries that we have seen. So we have a reflection. This reflection is based on what we went through yesterday. We were able to, go, those of you I think who are in the, in the World Cafe, they, uh, there are over 12 tables, and we were able to go through uh, five, maximum six, if you really want, you know, very uh, ambitiously. You would only go to five or six. So, but we, the, the two of us were able to go through them, and we analyzed uh, seven of them, uh, as you can see them. We, we, uh, from the reflection, we can see that local solutions featured or could have featured in several discussion groups. And from our, our analysis, we see that greater than 50% of these groups could have or featured local solutions. Uh, the first one on energy transition, for example, we, see, we, 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 uh, we believe that it should, should, should all, all countries should have local appropriate and affordable solutions. This is possible with energy as part of the energy solution, uh, transition. In reducing global emissions with near-term mitigation actions, we are saying include local solutions that are fast to implement uh, as part of this. In the national and subnational planning, we should, we should start from the, unknown, from the known, that is again local solutions, learning from the successes with these local solutions. And then the support for adaptation. We are saying frontline communities and vulnerable ecosystems need appropriate and affordable solutions. When it comes to financial flows, very important that we increase financial flows, but also increase share of the flows that really go to support local solutions in a whole range of areas, including uh, adaptation, mitigation, capacity building, and so on. Again, it comes to public finance. In the groups, uh, it is important that the, 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 these, uh, in, uh, people noted that it was important to increase public climate finance and also share of local solutions. This is key to reach out to the vulnerable uh, people that benefit from these local solutions, but also for the indebted countries, they, they, not, they not be credit worthy according to those institutions, then it's very important that we increase uh, public finance because loans are, have conditionalities that could not be afforded. And then when it comes to technology development and transfer, of course we start with what we know, include South-South transfer, and then we move on. And the last one from our analysis, a quick analysis from yesterday, the capacity building efforts. It's very important that sustainability hinges on starting with what works. What works, and these are local solutions for improvement and replicability. Uh, thank you very much. This was a quick uh, wrap-up of, uh, of the solutions and their relevance in the GST. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, and uh, I think it was a good summary that what we, we can do or what is possible to do. And now I would like to hear comments from Stefan Nizeoka. Uh, who is uh, from the Ministry of Energy, Kenya, and he is a Senior Deputy Director of Renewable Energy Department. We are very glad that he joined us, and uh, he can, uh, we, we are looking forward to his views and comments. Thank the floor you. is yours. I just want to make some comments, and um, mine is actually like talking notes, so I didn't have presentation. But I just comment generally on what uh, they have presented, and again also augment what um, nobody talked about: 100% um, renewable in Kenya. Um, generally, from what we have heard uh, from the speakers, like the last speaker, uh, we are not on track uh, in achieving Paris Agreement on climate change. So to achieve this, actually. Energy lies at the heart of uh, both uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So we need to address the issues of climate change, I mean, of energy, so that we may be able to uh, achieve the Paris Agreement. Uh, something also came out clearly that um, 
sustainable energy and modern energy is necessary for all of us um, and they will, um, this will open new world of opportunities uh, for billions of people living in the world in terms of economic opportunities, jobs, empowered women, children and youth, better education and health, and more sustainable, equitable and inclusive communities as uh, we have heard from the presentations. And again, also greater protections uh, from and resilience to climate change. You've seen the presentation from India. I was so much interested in um, the bamboo. The, it is like a total 100% utilization of bamboo can really address issues of climate change uh, on resilience to climate change. So in this case, um, I'm looking at the goal number seven, where we are supposed to have access to affordable and reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. And uh, from across board, again also I'm looking at the, um, the SDG 17, which is on partnerships. If I look across the government working together with um, um, developing, uh, developing partners and uh, NGOs and CSOs to achieve um, um, Paris Agreement and again also our SDGs by 2030. I just want to bring you to a perspective uh, globally. We have seven, 759 million people who remain without electricity access, according to the report by 2019. Um, 2.6 billion people still are using polluting fuels, as presented by um, uh, Swai from Tanzania. Uh, she has just mentioned about Tanzania case, but in the world, 2.6 billion still cook using uh, uh, polluting fuels. And um, uh, by 2021, 29%, uh, we had only reached renewable energy totally, a uh, 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 consumption in the whole world, only 29% were in renewable energy. So when you talk about 100% in Kenya, on average, the world is at 29% using uh, renewable energy. Now, just to augment to what uh, my colleague mentioned, uh, the reason why we are adding to 100% renewable is because we have a vision Vision 2030, uh, which is our blueprint in our country, and identified provision of um, reliable and adequate energy as a key enabler to sustainable development for us to be able to um, transform our country into middle income and industrializing, uh, industrializing country, which provides a high quality of life. So when we are targeting 100% renewable energy, we want to be there using this um, blueprint. I just want to bring you to, I mean, to augment on what um, my colleague said from Kenya. When I look at uh, where we were by 2013, we had only 2.3 million households being connected to electricity. Uh, up to 2021, we have almost um, contrap uh, made it four times to 8.8 .8 million. Um, households that are connected to electricity. And this has been achieved because uh, we have some strategies. In 2018, we drafted um, a national electrification strategy, which we call the Kenya National Electrification Strategy. And this has really driven uh, our connectivity in our country. And um, we are targeted to have 100% access to electricity by the end of 2022. But because of um, um, some court cases affecting some phases in the last mile connectivity, and again also COVID uh, affected our, our performance. Now, I was to talk about renewable energy development in our country. It's interesting that um, our energy mix generation is now at 77% of renewable energy. So when my colleague uh, talks about 100%, we are adding, we are adding there, Currently, we are at 77 percent of um, power generation mix at 77 percent, and um, what the consumers are consuming, what we are selling to the uh, customers, is at 93 percent renewable. So, when you talk about 100 percent renewable energy, and that is the reason why I want to uh, bring this power, so that um, when you are now talking about uh, electric cooking we can have it uh, as, a, as a local solution in our country, having availed um, electricity to everyone. The government has been supporting uh, solar PV electrification to all public institutions, including health facilities. And currently, uh, we have connected 22,000 institutions 
um, both on grid and off grid. Um, of interest, like my, co uh, my colleague from Kenya uh, gave uh, the targets which are bigger, but now piecemeal of what we have achieved. Um, in the year 2018, uh, we were able to launch um, um, a 51 megawatt uh, solar power plant in one of the areas in Northeastern. We also launched um, a 310 megawatts uh, wind power plant in March 2019. And last year, we were able to launch 100 megawatts in another area called Kipeto uh, in July. We have 78% uh, of our population living in um, sparsely populated area. And only 78% uh, lives on 18% um, uh, of the land. Then 18%, no, 12% lives in the rest, the bigger area. So connectivity to uh, those areas for them to be able to acquire electricity is a challenge. So we have a bigger project which we intend to cover those areas using mini grids. Uh, as mentioned by my colleague from Tanzania, those solutions. So we intend to electrify boreholes, solar home systems. And again also, we are providing clean cooking solutions in those counties because we realize that they're most affected by climate change because they're dry and uh, um, they have issues with climate change. Now, for us to be able to reach uh, those goals that uh, my colleague mentioned, the government uh, provides um, strategies and policies. So in 2020, we were able to launch a national bioenergy strategy, and this is uh, aiming at clean cooking. And this is where now the local solutions come in, uh, in Andy. We have an ambitious uh, calling to 100% adoption of clean cooking fuel by 2028. And last year, we were able to launch an energy compact on clean cooking. And we target to have all the institutions um, uh, using clean cooking technologies by 2028. We also launched a national electrification, uh, energy, national energy efficiency and conservation strategy, which aims at um, reducing, uh, I mean, improving energy efficiency in the country and 25% um, uh, of all new buildings being considered green by 2030. We have been working on all these strategies and policies um, with across board the partners. Uh, the CSOs have been of great help to us uh, and especially guiding us in terms of um, um, giving us data they have supported us um, uh, by providing valuable data and solutions, like now the local solutions. The NGOs, the CSOs have really partnered with us so that we may provide uh, the, the advice on policy and regulations. And they also demonstrate those local solutions that they can be able to work to uh, attain the last mile energy solutions in the country. So we really appreciate uh, how much the uh, NGOs and CSOs have really worked with the government and we really support um, the partnership that um, we are working. And again also, they have been um, of good help in overcoming investment barriers, uh, which includes energy service planning and delivery. For example, in one county in our country, we have 47 counties, they were of great help in developing the county energy plan in Kitui. So um, that was really a, a big plus for us, uh, where we had a lot of uh, support from the CSOs and the NGOs to achieve um, energy plan. Now we are now targeting at having in, um, integrated national energy planning, and uh, we have brought on board the CSO, the NGOs, to help us at the national level to have uh, an integrated national energy plan. So we really appreciate um, uh, what um, the CSOs have done. Again, also, we appreciate the knowledge sharing that uh, they come with. Uh, so from various countries, like now what you're learning from Tanzania, from Uganda, from India. Like I've taken something that personally I'll, I'll undertake, the bamboo. Mm. I'm moving from here, and by, by the end of the year, I need to have bamboo in my farm. Uh, 
which I'll utilize 100% because I've learned something. So we learn from the CSOs. And uh, what I've taken from here, I'm taking it again also at the, the policy level uh, to develop. Like we have um, 100 kilometers transacting the whole of Nairobi County. We have rivers along that, that place. And if we could um, maybe give it an individual, maybe every two kilometers or even one kilometer, or um, we give a, a group uh, of youth or women and they plant those bamboo along that river, then for another 25 years or more, uh, they'll be having, I mean, economic activities from, uh, from the same. It is something that I took from India. So the knowledge sharing has uh, come handy. And um, we are learning a lot from the CSOs and NGOs. So I thank you very much for inviting us for this forum. And um, we really look forward to working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation and uh, your comments and views. And uh, yes, I think also that uh, whenever we come into the for such an event in uh, the UN or other conferences, we look and learn a lot from each other. So it is not, uh, we don't have to uh, invent a wheel all the time. I mean, there are solutions which are used in, in some countries and sometimes we have forgotten them. And the other problem is that sometimes uh, these uh, big programs uh, driven by World Bank and uh, that, uh, or other big developers so focusing on the big things. And we need to focus on the local solutions for the small things because we are millions are cooking with more efficient cookstoves, then it is meaning a lot. So, um, and uh, so, now I, uh, I would uh, like to open the floor um, for uh, dialogue and uh, what barriers you see and what solutions you see on this uh, local solution connected to the local solutions and eventually for the 100% renewables. And uh, I, uh, I also know that uh, from Kenya we have a participant from the Gender Commission <laughs> Betty, uh, and uh, if you have any kind of comment also from gender point of view, I, I would welcome to, uh, that you would comment it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, this, this is a very uh, important and practical uh, presentation, so to say. And I can see besides what Kenya has demonstrated it has done, uh, we can see a lot of, um, yeah, we can see a lot of emulations uh, which are cutting across many countries. Uh, obviously, we, we, we face a lot of, um, we don't face winter. So the Amsterdam uh, presentation, which we, we appreciate, obviously also contributes to the, um, to the climate uh, action discussions, you know. Uh, and therefore, it's a, a whole collated, a whole collegiate uh, effort by countries across the world in uh, reducing the carbon emissions. Uh, I'm here with the two commissioners from the National Gender and Equality Commission, Commissioner uh, Caroline Lentupuru and also Commissioner Thomas Coyer. I wish to recognize their presence here. Uh, Commissioner Caroline represents the indigenous, uh, where we have a lot of people displaced because of uh, climate action consequences and Commissioner Thomas, uh, the effect of uh, climate actions on the youth. Now, in our commission, which stands for the gender, uh, we cut across the women, the youth, the persons with disability, the minority and marginalized. You realize that um, uh, affordability is quite a big issue because uh, even affording the solar panels is one um, a great challenge people may be having because sun is free in Africa, sun is free in Kenya. You know, we enjoy a lot of sun. And it would be very important that we are able to access the solar uh, energy, which has actually progressively um, seen a lot of good improvements, you know, because we have quite a number of households having the solar panels. But I think largely, uh, because of the climate action effects, 
uh, and a lot of deforestation. You find a lot of people then now migrating from one end to another and being displaced. So those consequences are actually things that the government is also addressing. But I think we want to take uh, recognition of the fact that working with the Ministry of Energy, uh, Engineer Nzioka here, we've been able to do a very important research which has been funded by the government on green energy absorption in Kenya. We've been looking at the hydro, we've been looking at the solar, we've been looking at the wind power, we've been able to uh, visit those plants and see the effect that they have in actually contributing to the national grid in our country and accessing energy to uh, various households. Indeed, I just want to finish by saying that where we were in Kenya many years ago and where we are right now, tremendous progress, I must say. Uh, towards absorption of renewable, renewable energy, energy, sorry, and we look forward to even having the scales read higher and higher going forward because a lot can be harnessed. We are blessed with rain, so there's a lot of hydro that we can harness from. We are, we are blessed with sun, so there's a lot that we can harvest from. So we are looking at all this together, and I think the relevant ministries are doing a fantastic job, and even organizations like where Nobat uh, is coming from join together, I think Kenya is taking a good lead in East Africa and we are happy to work with Uganda, obviously in Tanzania. We appreciate the effort that has come through this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, um, I'm opening a floor. <laughs> Anybody uh, has a... Yeah? Yeah, I, uh, I just uh, want to continue a little bit on this because now we are here together just before that uh, real dialogues are starting, we had this World Cafe yesterday where some of us participated, but just now after this event here, the negotiators will start in the technical dialogue about the global stock take. And uh, I think it's important to say that we have very good examples like uh, Kenya, who actually in the NDC and also in their practice on the ground are taking up many of these local solutions. We have many other countries where it's like being forgotten. We have uh, some countries where it's actually happening a lot of things on the ground, but it's not reflected in the NDC and it doesn't really come up to this global level. So how do we make sure that this global level is actually in giving us an, uh, a push and giving us a full rewarding for having these local solutions and how do we make the international also financial flows etc supporting more the local solutions that are difficult for big banks for instance to to address yes and and we given some of our recommendations here what uh, richard told but i mean we're also happy to look at if you have your ideas on this <laughs> Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. It's so interesting to realize where is the um, scope and also the aims of these renewable energies. I have two questions for your experience. First of all, I would like to know um, if um, the renewable energy has the completely capacity to up the level and become more industrial economy and all, not only for cover or meet uh, these basic necessities the people needed to the access of energy. And the second question um, is related how you face the effects of the climate change. Because all of your uh, renewable energy is based on the uh, hydro, hydro situation in your country, but how you face the, um, the draws, how you face um, these, this change. Maybe I, I can ask most on the first one, because we have been, before we started to work on actual how uh, countries in, for instance, Africa could change to renewable energy, we're working a lot about how European countries can change, and they are part of, many European countries are some of the most industrialized countries in the world. And we realized that out of the 27 EU countries, something like 25 could do with their own renewable energy resources, uh, while there was ample supply if we cooperate inside Europe, so we have some uh, export, for instance, from offshore power uh, with wind power into uh, Central European countries like Czech Republic, where there's not so much wind, then it's possible to capture the entire EU 27 countries with renewable energy in a relatively short time. So I'm not so afraid of energy 
renewable energy for uh, for industries. And if you're interested, there's a number of scenarios are out. Again, this is not the topic of this uh, uh, event today, but I'll be happy to tell you about some of which which country you're thinking about and how what con what scenarios there are to actually supply that renewable energy. Uh, there's a couple of industrial processes we have to think in other ways, like for instance, steel is used mainly produced with coal, but there are now also ways to do it with hydrogen that can be produced renewable. Thank you. Uh, well, you had the other question, and that's about how we feel climate change. And I have to say that we don't feel climate change a lot in Denmark. Somehow it's not really, but you know, here in Germany last year there was a big catastrophe where suddenly there was unexpected heavy rain that overflowed the rivers and pe many people died. If any of my colleagues would like to s tell about the, what you feel about climate change or comment on the question. Maybe I can just mention about uh, Kenya. If you look at the statistics my colleague presented, uh, we are talking of um, 9,000 um, megawatts uh, from wind. In the northeastern there is somewhere you don't even need to do a visibility study to install the solar wind systems. You just need to come up with um, uh, with your turbines and generate wind. So no need of even uh, funding for feasibility study because the wind is so strong. We have a cross. You could have uh, so many wind farms along that uh, corridor. So the potentials are there. Uh, when it comes to uh, the geothermal, we have a potential of 10,000 megawatts. And currently, we are even uh, having a challenge of uh, the steam. So we have even uh, decided to introduce industrial parks around um, where we have the geothermal power stations. And uh, that industrial park, uh, we want to, uh, I mean, um, the eye to abate industries like cement and uh, other uh, steel could be relocated in that place so that they can be able to use the steam that um, comes from the geothermal apart from the power. And again, also, even the, the power during the, um, the time when uh, people are asleep, or it is idle, so they could be able to utilize that power from, from that. So in terms of climate change, um, we like, currently we are um, facing some droughts. So during that time, our hydro power stations um, are affected. But now we have um, fallback in terms of wind in terms of geothermal, in terms of solar, we are able to uh, capitalize on that. So um, actually there's not much, um, uh, like the way it used to happen in 80s and 90s. I remember in the 80s when we have droughts, then we had frequent uh, power outages. Nowadays power outages are no more thing, uh, I mean it's something in the past because um, the, the, uh, we, have, we are focusing on the geothermal and uh, uh, other sources, renewable energy sources. So um, the, the impact are there in terms of uh, the hydrology of the dams. But again, also, we also have some programs that are mitigating. We have a, a, a big program which um, uh, is taking care of uh, um, the afforestation of um, uh, where, we, where we have the, the, the hydro dams. So every year we are planting, replanting trees so that um, we, have, uh, we can be able to save on the hydrology uh, of uh, our uh, dams. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. It's really inspiring to see that Kenya is already heading towards 100% renewable energy. My name is Mavis. I work with Climate Analytics, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself. So. Um, I have a question, and this would go to Mr. Izioka. Um, so um, Kenya is planning some coal plant development, um, and uh, my question is that is this going to, or 
Do you see that this could potentially stall the progress that the country is making towards or the plan to head towards 100% renewable energy and potentially lead to stranded assets as a lot, the world is um, moving away from coal? So is this um, an issue or do you see that uh, in, your, in your opinion? Thank you. Good question. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe we take remaining questions now because we have promised to end on time and I see you have five minutes left. <laughs> um, Hi, um, my name is Rohit. I work with Iklai Local Governments for Sustainability, and uh, I lead the work on sustainable energy around um, globally in all offices. Um, we are also working on uh, our flagship work with 100% renewables, um, working in different countries, Argentina, Indonesia, and Kenya is one of them. Um, so we have been working at county level, so working with subnational governments, um, looking at Kisumu County, Nakuru County, and Mombasa how they can plan their transition towards 100% renewables. So this is great to hear uh, what the work that you all have done and are doing currently. My question to the panel is one, um, on the clean cooking part. Um, with your scenario development for 100% renewables, and I'm reflecting to the ones that have been done from International Energy Association, uh, sorry, International Energy uh, Agency and IRENA, where they have said 50% or more needs to be electrified for the uh, end consumption. So how do you see the cooking part um, in, in Kenya or other parts um, in other countries um, working out? So clean cooking will always be uh, with, um, let's say, bio, traditional biomass or other fuels, or can it happen uh, with electricity? My second part is, uh, question is, uh, f uh, Mr. Minister, um, just, just short. Um, at the national level, you're working on um, Kenya transitioning towards 100% renewables. We are working at subnational levels. How do you see this work integrating with multi-level governance, and how do you plan to propose forward with this? Thank you. There are only one and a half minutes to be back, so I'm not sure that we can answer all oh, these okay. questions. So, yes, let us just respond to the two questions. I mean, to the two, um, uh, uh, three questions that have been asked. In terms of coal, we have shaved that idea, so it's no longer an issue towards 100% re renewable. It's not a question that we are addressing because we have decided to go the 100% renewable. Concerning clean cooking, uh, we have a, um, an ambitious strategy, I mean an amb ambitious goal of achieving clean cooking by 2028. Currently we are uh, developing a clean cooking strategy and electricity uh, cooking, uh, electric cooking strategy which we want to focus, uh, we are focusing on 2028. And that's the reason why I said we have even come up with Energy Compact 2028, uh, 2021, which focuses on clean cooking. And we want to start with institutions to all of them transition by 2025 or 2028, I, I, I think 2028, to be fully on clean cooking. Uh, coming uh, to the, I mean, the 100% uh, renewable energy, uh, projects that targets the three counties. Actually, I'm the lead coordinator in the ministry, so I participate in that. Uh, we really work together to achieve. It is, in, uh, in, it is integrating, it is working towards our goal of 100% renewable. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then if you would like to hear a little bit about electric cooking and pressure cooker, then uh, uh, please contact afterwards Mary from Tanzania. Yeah. And if oh, I may just say to, uh, just question on that scenario, we are not planning on a 50% electric cooking, but definitely much more electric cooking, but also very efficient electric cooking, like uh, Mary said, because it's not, a, not enough to change to electric cooking. People, why people haven't done it now is because it's expensive and with much less consumption for electricity, it's doable for much more people. Uh, but that's particularly to reduce uh, charcoal use, but with efficient uh, Bama's cooking, we don't think we need to. We can still have sustainable uh, biomass production for, uh, for cooking with efficient biomass for a large part of the population, but electric cooking is definitely an important part. I don't know if my colleagues no, would like no, to say is, We have no more time. We have no more time. Sorry. So uh, going for the efficient uh, two-pot uh, cook stoves with chimney, <laughs> And uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And uh, I would like to uh, conclude that it was a good discussion, and we all learned and uh, shared knowledge. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Yeah.